Good morning, Namabudai Bante. I have three questions. Uh, first question is, you mentioned that the Buddha Dharma is for everyone. But if that's the case, then why do we chant in Pali, not other languages? <laughs> and my okay. let, me, let me start with that one. Okay. So I, because I, I've been teaching for nine days, my mind is getting a bit whizzy. I can't remember it very well anymore. In the beginning, you can t give me three or four questions I remember, but now it's kind of uh, a little bit of the shaky side. So, uh, so, so why do we chant in Pali? This is a very good question. It is to encourage you to learn Pali. That's why we're doing it. <laughs> uh, but I, you are right. And I, I think that actually we should try to understand what we're chanting. It's really important. Uh, so either you understand what the Pali means, yeah, that is actually already get the good translation by Venerable Vikibodhi or by Bhante Sujato, whoever it is, uh, and then you kind of look it up and then next time you know. Uh, or we chant in English. Uh, I don't know, what, or whatever one's language is, yeah, you chant in that language. Uh, that can often be powerful, like the Metta Sutta in English. Uh, this is what should be done. It's actually very beautiful, yeah? And uh, it's almost like, it's more than metta, it's almost a whole path right there in that metta sutta. Good point. Yeah. So it's, the meaning is important, right? Meaning is very, very important. One of the, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of that, right? Uh, and uh, an example of that is what is called the Bhujanga Paritta. A Paritta is a protection chant, uh, and the Bhujanga Paritta is one of these protection chants. It means the factors of awakening Paritta. And uh, in the suttas, uh, there are three occasions when the Bhujanga Paritta is chanted. Uh, and one of those occasions is a monk called Mahachunda. Actually, you, had, you know you had Chula Chunda here just recently? Yeah? This is Mahachunda. This is his older brother. Yeah? So, <laughs> and so Mahachunda, the Buddha asks Mahachunda, please, I'm, I'm sick. Could you please chant the seven factors of awakening? Yeah? Yeah, and then the Buddha emerges from his illness after Mahachunda chants the seven factors of awakening. And that has always been very mind-blowing to me because what is, how is that possible, right? The Buddha is the Buddha. Why does he need to hear these factors of awakening from another monk? Yeah. And uh, I think the answer is simply that, you know, he's probably weak like everyone is when the body is down and just someone else reminding him of those qualities and he can think about them and reflect on them because of that. The very fact that these things are so powerful gives brightness to the mind and that overcomes the illness. But the only way that they give brightness to the mind is if he understands the content, right? He has to understand the words, otherwise it doesn't work. What does it mean if you just say in a foreign language, it means nothing. And so that again shows you that the meaning of the word actually is very, very significant. All right. Uh, my... Actually, I only have two questions. The third question I won't ask. Um, you said that the Buddha found the Dhamma. Then who created it? <laughs> the, the, the Dhamma is the, um, the, nature, the nature of things, right? It's kind of the world, the way the world is. So what you're asking about is who created the world. That's what you're creating. That's really what you're asking. Yeah? Yes. And, uh, and uh, Buddhism, does, there is no creator according to Buddhism now. And uh, I think to me, this is one of the things that makes, again, there are so many things that makes Buddhism absolutely unique in the history of the world. This is also one of those things. So according to the Buddha, there is no first point to be found. You can go back and back and back, and there's always an earlier cause before the previous, previous cause, always something else that caused the previous thing. And to me, that is a far more sensible reply than that the universe suddenly started. Yeah, I, if, even if you look at modern science, modern science say, well, the universe started with the Big Bang, and they don't really know what happened before that. Uh, that is also unsatisfactory, because the Big Bang is like a miracle then. Where did it come from, right? Uh, and so people say, oh, yeah, that means that God was there, he kind of made the Big Bang. Yeah. But, I, you know, scientists understand that that is unsatisfactory, so they're looking for prior causes. And there are scientists today who, who kind of talk about the cyclical universe and these kind of things uh, and so, to me, this is actually a really, really satisfying answer that there is no first point. There is no, because the moment you say that, if you say that some power created the universe, well, where did that power come from? You haven't really answered anything by saying that. You're just kind of postponing the answer to, some, uh, to something else. And uh, so you have the same problem. So thank you. But you can ask your third question as well, if you like. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, go for it. Uh, the third question is when you talk about um, that Buddhism is unique and it's for everyone. Yeah. But 
from my understanding, many other major religions also said the same thing. Yeah. So, so what I am, it's a very good question. So thank you for asking it. So what I, what I was talking about there is the origin of the religion, right? Where they come from. And if you look at, look at the origin of Judaism, for example, if you read the Bible, uh, yeah, the Old Testament, you will see it was a covenant. It was an agreement between the people of Israel and their God. Uh, and they had their God and the neighboring tribe had a separate God. Yeah? And that is why you have things like, you shall have no other God than me, because that was their protective God, protector of that particular tribe. And so, so many of the things in Christianity come out of this small society idea of a small culture which has their specific God looking after them. Yeah? So from the beginning, it started out as a kind of what I would call a parochial religion. And all religions in the world tend to start out in that way. The difference is Buddhism. The Buddhism started out as a universal religion from the very beginning. It wasn't for the Indians at that time. It was straight away for the whole world. That is a difference. Sir. So it's the starting point. The starting point, yeah, and that's really important, uh, yeah, because uh, sure we can develop it into something else, uh, but it means that many of those parochial elements they are still part of the religion, and uh, they make it makes it very different because of that. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, Sadhu Yeah. Next question. Anyone? It's a very rare opportunity for Adam Ramali to be here with us in Malaysia. So please ah, uh, seize the opportunity to ask questions, if you have any meaningful questions. <laughs> it can help you grow in your faith, your yeah. wisdom, your serenity. It can also be meaningless, actually. That's all right. Uh, okay. doesn't matter. We, we make meaning out of them. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Hmm. Any other questions? Learning uh, questions? Yeah, if there are stupid questions, they are usually really good. So please ask really stupid questions. Yeah. They are yeah. usually the, yeah. the best. Everyone has probably has that stupid question. Huh? So, uh, ah, okay. Yes. Uh, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Explain, uh, to uh, elaborate further on the question by the young gentleman, yeah. who started the Dharma? <laughs> in that sense, the, since you were talking about discovery about yeah. the beginning, yeah. so obvious question by another a, a normal person would be, how did the Dhamma come about? So if the Buddha discovered the, the Dhamma, yeah. obviously there's the starting point to it. It's in the normal mindset. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a there's a starting point to to the uh, human understanding of it. Uh, yeah. But. Uh, uh, the nature itself exists without human beings understanding it. Uh, it is like I exist now, but whether I understand myself, that is a very different question. Uh, and that is the different, that is the Buddha. The Buddha, everyone knows that they existed. That is Dhamma. We exist. The world is here. We experience things. There is Dukkha. There is all of these kind of things. Uh, but then there wasn't the understanding of how it operates. Uh, yeah, that was the difference. And that start understanding of how it operates, that began with the Buddha. But the underlying reality was always there. Uh, the Buddha says that, in fact, in the suttas. He says that, uh, you know, whether someone discovers dependent origination or not, uh, whether someone discovers the ideas of impermanence or non-self, uh, yeah, whether they, they are discovered or not, they are always there regardless. Uh, so they are, they are potentially present. The discovery is always potentially possible. Yeah? That is kind of the idea they are there. So there is Dhamma, which is just nature, the reality thing, and then there is the discovery of the Dhamma. The discovery of the Dhamma has a beginning, but the actual Dhamma, the underlying reality, is always there. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, please fire away, everyone. Please don't be shy. Yeah, just uh, go for it. Ah, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning, Ajahn. Good Brahman. morning. Yeah. Thank you for the sharing. Yeah. Uh, I have a few questions as well. Let me just start with the first one. So, if you're if you're describing the Dharma as as somehow universal or like a part of reality without necessarily human beings understanding it, yeah. I'm uh, this uh, like my my question is more about knowing or understanding the Dharma. Do we then need the Buddha? How important then is the Buddha to help us understand the Dharma? If like anyone could discover it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in principle, anyone can discover. That's the point. Yeah. In principle, anyone can. It's just that it is very hard. And this is kind of the point. It's a very profound thing. Yeah. 
And uh, the idea, and what is profound is the idea of non-self, because it is something that is so close to us, uh, so fundamentally how we see ourselves as human beings, as having a self, uh, that penetrating that and understanding that is actually in incredibly difficult. Uh, and that's why it is very rare in human history that someone will have the required spiritual qualities. Uh, yeah, When all those spiritual qualities come together, then someone is able to penetrate that and understand what is going on. Uh, but that takes a lot of coincidences for that to happen. Uh, and that's why it is so rare. So in principle, anyone can be a Buddha. In principle, anyone can discover it. Uh, but in reality, it happens incredibly rare because it, is, uh, it takes all of these things coming together. Sometimes if you think about uh, what it is that is required for these things to come together. Yeah? So first of all, you have to have someone like the Buddha who by chance or by you know, his past actions or whatever has built up lots of good qualities. Yeah? As a child, he had a jhana, ex samadhi experience, a jhana experience. Uh, yeah, so someone who is there, almost on the verge of samadhi already, very, very close to um, if you have samadhi, you're close to discovering the truth. Uh, you may need a society that is respectful of monastics, uh, where monastics get support, yeah, where it's easy to go into the forest. Uh, a society where people are already practicing almost to the level of awakening, like samadhi, but not quite there. And when all of these factors come together, then there is a good chance you, you may succeed. But if you look at the modern world, it's kind of unlikely, right? I mean, if, if I, in Australia, if I kind of go into the bush and start to meditate, uh, there's no one to support me here. There's no teachers, yeah? There's no idea of samadhi anywhere. And so it is almost impossible because of these uh, supporting factors are actually missing here. Yeah? So I think that is the, uh, that is roughly the answer here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. Thank you, Arjun. Yeah. Uh, my next question relates to one of the things that you shared in the talk. So you, you said like, it's sometimes hard to picture the Buddha as a human being yeah. because he, uh, or, or to, to be in action and, and taking care of people and all that, because like he seems so uh, always in Samadhi, he seems so cold. Sometimes this happens in my attempt to like share the, the, the Dhamma with my friends as well. For, for them, sometimes it's harder to relate to the Buddha. He seems very distant. Yeah. He yeah. seems very like otherworldly or yeah. non-human. Yeah. So uh, I guess two sub questions. First question is like, why do you think that is the case among the Buddhist community in among the Buddhists? Mike test among the Buddhists. Yeah. Like, why do we? Uh, why does it seem difficult or unlikely for us to mm. to relate to the Buddha as a human being? And secondly, I guess what could we do as as Buddhist leaders, Buddhist yeah. teachers, to to maybe help more people like relate to the Buddha more personally yeah. and, and sort of experience him more directly in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. No, that's, a, that's something that has always been very close to my heart, actually, to try to find out how to do that. So I, it's, a, it's a very good question. And one of them is, uh, I think, to uh, understand, I mean, one of the problems with the history of Buddhism is that it is a history in always elevating the Buddha more and more and making the Buddha kind of more and more separate from us. Uh, yeah, and, uh, the, you know, you start reading... Uh, uh, later texts after the time of the Buddha, the later they are, the more miraculous and more kind of weird things happen and more, uh, the more the Buddha becomes this abstract thing which has no relationship to ordinary beings anymore. Uh, and so what we need to do, the first thing is we need to recapture the Buddha of the suttas. Uh, and that's why I took some of those passages from the suttas I just did now because that actually gives us better access to the Buddha as a human being than some of these later texts. Uh, uh, so we need to recognize that actually the Buddha, no, you know, all of this later stuff, all the miracles, all the weird things, actually that is probably not really all that real. It is not so important. The Buddha, what is amazing about the Buddha, and to me this is what is really worthy of the supreme confidence and worthy of the supreme respect, is precisely the fact that you take the human condition and you become enlightened and you see the nature of reality. That is what is so extraordinary about the Buddha. That is what is so amazing. If he is a god, it's not, no longer amazing, right? Because he's already different from us fundamentally. Well, okay, so a god becomes enlightened. Okay, whatever, yeah? I don't know anything about that. That's, kind of, that's not strange at all, yeah? But it is precisely the fact that he is a human being. And he takes that uh, to, you know, to this kind of extent. That is what is so extraordinary, yeah? 
And so, uh, it, uh, and so we need to kind of reclaim the, the person, the Buddha, see him as a real person, get away from all of the kind of super normal stuff, uh, not completely, but to, to a large extent, uh, and see the humanity of the Buddha. This is number one yeah, thing that we need to do. Uh, the second thing I think we need to do is we need to uh, close the historical gap between us and the Buddha, because uh, uh, part of the problem is that the Buddha existed two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, he existed in a different culture. Uh, and so we have an automatic feeling uh, that there is a gap between us and the Buddha. Yeah? Two and a half thousand years ago, they didn't even have iPhones, for goodness sake. Yeah? So what kind of people were that? Yeah? They were really, really primitive or, or, or whatever. Yeah? We have this feeling of people who were primitive, simple. They had a different outlook. Yeah? And so there is a sense that there is this gap between us and them. And again, a lot of that gap can be overcome by reading the suttas. You read the word of the Buddha, you see that people at, at that time were largely the same as they are now. People in those days, they were at war with each other, they were arguing with each other, they were lying, they were ambitious, they were fighting, uh, they fell in love. Yeah, they had love songs, let's talk about the love song before, and then they had heartache when the loved one didn't really want to do what they wanted to do, and then they died, and they, it's basically exactly the same. Yeah, human society basically facing exactly the same problems, the same issues, now as it did then. There is that gap, it's just an artifact of time, an artifact of different society, but it's not real. There isn't any, any real gap there. I predict that if I took you, yeah, uh, if I take you, <laughs> if I took you and kind of transported you to India two and a half thousand years ago and dropped you into that society in India, you, here you are in India, right? Uh, and initially, it would be a little bit of a shock for you because initially the customs are different, uh, a different language or whatever. Uh, but I bet it wouldn't take long before you felt completely at home in that society uh, because people are essentially the same. Yeah? The heart of people is the same. If you travel around the world, uh, I have traveled a lot in my life, yeah? a lot, like before I became a monk. Yeah? And uh, I, people are the same everywhere. Yeah? The basic ideas, the basic desires, the basic aspirations we have as a human beings are, are the same. There is a thin layer of culture on the outside. That's the difference. Uh, that is just a thin layer of culture. Yeah? And so when you reduce that gap, you take that away, and you understand that those people are basically the same, uh, then you start to see the reality. There is, um, you know, they often talk about uh, uh, the biases of human beings. We have all kinds of biases in the way we perceive the world and the way we perceive things. Uh, um, uh, you have confirmation bias in psychology and these kind of things. But there's one kind of bias which is interesting. It's called the present bias. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, the present bias is the idea how we always uh, give preference to the present. Yeah, The present is always more important. The present is more real. And anything that even if it existed only 100 years ago, it's already kind of history and it kind of doesn't really matter. Yeah, you, you see those films, black and white films from the 1950s or 30s, and they talk really fast and really funny and you think it's a different... <laughs> yeah, it seems alien in a sense. Yeah, so there's a present bias that the present time is more important, more significant, more real than any previous times. And that is part of the problem. Yeah, this is how we create this gap between us and the Buddha. So we need to collapse all of these gaps, collapse the, collapse the cultural gap, collapse the gap of time, collapse the gap of seeing the Buddha as some kind of non-human deity or whatever. And when you collapse all those gaps, the Buddha becomes human after a while. And then you can respect the Buddha in all the right kind of ways. Then you actually want to go to the Buddha and ask questions. But Venerable Sir, what is going on here? Why, why am I suffering? What, how do I get out of this question? How do I get out of this? You start to relate to the Buddha as a human being. Then he can become your teacher. And then when you really take the Buddha as your teacher in that way, or at least the teacher of teachers, uh, then you start to be able to do the Buddha Nusati. Uh, you get joy in having a person who is so powerful. Uh, I was just mentioning a few days ago on the retreat that we are doing that um, this idea of uh, Buddha Nusati, uh, I was reminded by, I was in Sri Lanka only uh, quite recently before I came here, and I was speaking to this old Danish monk, uh, who is now more Sri Lankan than the Sri Lankans, but anyways, we, he grew up in Denmark, you know, people become, become the new nation they're in. Uh, 
And, uh, and he was telling me that back in the old days when he was still living in uh, Denmark and he was a student, uh, he was like a hippie, he had long hair and it was kind of, this was back in the 19, late 1960s, the flower power and the hippie times in, in, in Europe. Uh, and he said that uh, at that time, because he was kind of a semi-hippie, he would read those books that the hippies would read. And that would often be kind of spiritual books, you know, books about meditation, all these kind of things. Uh, and he told me that when he read that there are people in the world who enter altered states of consciousness, uh, people who reach a higher state of mind, uh, people who have samadhi experiences, people who have insight into the nature of reality. He said just reading that uh, made him feel joyful. Yeah, it made him joyful because he knew that there is more to the human experience than just the mundane, ordinary things that everyone goes through. There are real <coughs> spiritual experiences to be had. And just the ordinary humdrum life is not the end of the story. And so this is what he said. So he could make that relation because these were living people. Yeah, it's e sometimes easy to make that relationship with living people. Ajahn Brahm, he comes here, he sits on the seat, presumably, right? Uh, then you can have a relationship with someone like that. Uh, and so we need to make that same relationship with the Buddha. Actually, if these hippies uh, had a bit of samadhi or they were going to the gurus who had samadhi or whatever, the Buddha had much more. Uh, if these people are worthy of respect, uh, if these people are worthy to feel joyful about their existence, we should feel much more joyful about the existence of the Buddha. The Buddha is also human. The Buddha is like us. He's showing the way for us, uh, for what actually is possible in this world. Uh, when the Buddha teaches us in the suttas, uh, he is not teaching as a god, uh, teaching an ordinary human being. He's teaching as one person who has the living experience of what it means to be human, teaching another human. He knows what it's like to be human. He has been through the same things. Uh, and once you see the Buddha in this way, then you make a real connection with the Buddha. Yeah? He becomes a real teacher. He doesn't become some kind of faint kind of thing far away. He becomes real. There's much more to be said about this, but I will uh, <laughs> leave it for now because I'm, I'm going on a little bit. Uh, so, um, Good morning, Ajahn Brahmali. Good morning. I, I really like how you humanize Buddha. It makes it very relatable. Mm -hmm. So I have this question that I think you have mentioned a few times as well, that kindness and compassion, I think that was really mentioned many, many times. <laughs> and uh, that really is really our guiding principle. So in reality, sometimes it can be very en de-energizing. I think back to the question that you asked, how are we today? We have our ups, we have our downs. Yeah. And sometimes we have very de-energizing moments when we yeah. live around surroundings who may not necessarily practice Buddhism, so do not really understand how is it like to be compassionate and sort of to be kind. Yeah. And therefore, you know, how do we then find the balance when the, amidst this chaotic mm. external chaos and all, and I, I know we need our, our own internal peace and uh, tranquility, but how do we then nurture our inner growth and also being kind to our, our own well-being mm. when we are also facing all this external chaos? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So um, uh, there's a number of things to be said about that. And the, the first thing you said, you know, when people around you are lacking in good qualities, yeah, they don't have the kindness and compassion. Uh, sometimes that can be uh, kind of, uh, uh, you kind of, you know, you lose your kind of faith in humanity or you, or you kind of, it becomes a downer or a negative thing or whatever. Uh, uh, what you have to do in those cases is to have compassion for these people. Uh, because people who are not kind, who don't have good qualities, they are they need compassion, yeah, because they don't really understand what is important in life. Uh, so when you see unkindness, the right response is always compassion. Uh, either compassion or seeing the good qualities that may also be there, because people are often complex, they may be unkind at one time, at another time they are kind, uh, yeah? So seeing, remembering also the underlying good qualities. Uh, that is a starting point, yeah, to kind of see people in a different way. Actually, if someone is unkind, probably they want to be kind. I think almost everybody wants to be kind. Why? Because we know that kindness leads to happiness for ourselves and for others. Deep down, we know that. And yet our conditioning, uh, the kind of the baggage that we have from the early in this life, our parents, our schools, maybe past lives, whatever, the baggage is so strong that it forces us to do bad things, even though we actually really deep down would like to do good things all the time. If I ask you, would you like to always be kind? You would, right? But are you able to always be kind? 
You're not, right? And it's, because it's impo almost impossible to be always be kind. You know, even if, you, if I say to someone, don't have a single angry thought for the next week, they will say impossible. Yeah, almost everybody has a little bit of ill will occasionally, right? Even the most pure of people occasionally have a smidgen of negativity arising in their mind. Yeah. Uh, so not, not the Buddha, of course, but uh, <laughs> most, many, many people. Yeah. And so uh, when you start to see that, you know, it's much more easy to have compassion for people because you know that they actually are trapped. Uh, they are trapped in conditioning. Yeah? They are trapped in uh, uh, the past, in habits, bad habits, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and so then you can kind of uh, see people in a new way. Uh. So this is number one. Number two is that you need a regular diet of good Dhamma talks. Uh. Yeah? Forget about food. Yeah? Food is not important. Dhamma talks is what matters. So you have a regular diet of good Dhamma talks. Uh. And uh, by regular, I don't mean all the time, because if it's all the time, it gets too much. Uh, but especially whenever you need a bit of a boost, a mental boost, uh, go and have listened to a nice Dhamma talk. But choose your Dhamma teachers with care. Yeah? Number one Dhamma teacher is the Buddha. Yeah, the number one Dhamma teacher. So uh, Dhamma talks that align with the word of the Buddha is really important. I understand that many people don't like to read the suttas. I get that, because reading the suttas can be you know, hard work and repetitive and boring, and it, it may not feel like it relates to you, whatever. But at the very least, finding Dhamma teachers that roughly are aligned with the Dhamma is really, really important. Uh, and that is not always the case. One of the ways of ensuring that is that they actually teach the suttas. Yeah, they actually teach from the word of the Buddha. Uh, and then you have to make sure they also interpret that word right. So it's a bit complicated. But uh, after a while, you get a feeling for what teachers are worthy of listening to and what teachers are best avoided. Yeah, that is kind of a, the world is a bit like that. It's important to make these kind of judgments because it actually is true that sometimes some teachers are more true for the word than Buddha and others. And then you, and if someone should also be inspiring, should be an inspiring teacher, it's really important that they are inspiring because if someone is inspiring, it lifts your spirit as well. It gives you energy when you come back. Yeah. This is what I love about my teacher, Rajan Brahm. Yeah. I, sometimes at Bodhinyana Monastery, I just uh, go in the Dhamma hall, he gives a talk. Yeah? And I just sit there, close my eyes. Uh, and I don't even have to listen to the talk. Usually I listen, of course, but uh, I don't even have to listen. I just kind of draw in the vibes, yeah. And after the talk is over, I feel really peaceful. I feel really nice. I feel re-energized, yeah. So after now nine days in Malaysia, I go and listen to Rajan Brahm. <laughs> I re <laughs> recharge the batteries to kind of come back together. So uh, that is a very important point. Someone who has that ability to inspire you is actually also important. Uh, and then when those things come together, then hopefully you have some foundation for, uh, for carrying on with, the, uh, with your practice. So, yeah. Maybe you can have one last question. <laughs> yeah, this, this young man over here wanted to ask another question. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, this will be my last question. Um, <laughs> I don't believe it. I'm <laughs> yeah, seriously. For today, you mean? For today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. you said to humanize the Buddha. Yeah. Um, this might be a bit disrespectful, so I want to apologize. <laughs> first. Um, you mentioned that the Buddha actually looks like ordinary monks. Then why do we have a statue of the Buddha with the <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. If, I, if I think about it, when I see a picture of a monk, I mean, in a temple somewhere that, of course, I also bow to them, it has a different feeling when you bow to the very big golden Buddha statue. Yeah, so yeah. Um, why not? Um, is there a particular reason why the statue of the Buddha these days looks like this? Be okay, I, I know a bit of the history is because of the uh, Greeks, right? So yeah. But why don't they change it right now? Now we have deeper understanding of uh, the history itself. Yeah, I, true. We, uh, we could change it. Uh, uh, but traditions are very strong. Yeah, and traditions tend to kind of carry on because they are strong. Yeah. To be the person who makes the change is often difficult because you, you stand out like a sore thumb if you make the change first. Yeah? And a lot of people criticize you when you make these kind of changes. So actually, it's difficult. Uh, you have to have a very strong kind of sense of independence to do that. Uh, 
I, uh, you know, this is kind of one of those things. I saw that with Ajahn Brahm because he, he ordained the nuns, the bhikkhunis down in Perth. Uh, and uh, that was kind of, it takes a very strong person to be able to do that sort of thing and to withstand the criticism that comes afterwards. Uh, because he was criticized very heavily and he was basically ostracized by the people who used to be his friends. Yeah, everyone kind of left uh, and then he kind of was on his own. Uh, and he can deal with that, but it takes, it takes a strong personality. So uh, we can do it. And in fact, some people are already doing it. If you walk up the stairway over there, there's an uh, image, there's a painting on the wall. Uh, mm. It's done in, uh, in Indonesia. And that looks like an ordinary human being when you look at that painting. Yeah, mm. I don't know if I fully agree with the, 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 fa the features, but anyway, it, is a, you know, it is, looks like an ordinary human being. Yeah. But remember, the point about a Buddha statue is not to replicate what the Buddha looks like. Yeah. I don't think it should look exactly like a human being yeah? because what the idea of a Buddha statue is more to represent the qualities of the Buddha. We don't know what the Buddha looked like. Yeah? So the moment you kind of put a face, a real face on the Buddha, already you are distorting it in a sense. Uh, mm. So a Buddha statue should look peaceful. Uh, it should have a certain kind of smile. It should look ben benevolent. Yeah? There should be a kind of a degree of wisdom maybe about it. And if those qualities are visible in the Buddha statue, that is the most important thing. Yeah? Yes, we could take off the top knot. That's kind of one of the, that's there because of the 30, one of the 32 marks of a great man, the Mahapuri Salakana, as he called in Pali. We could make the ears a bit shorter. I'm not sure why they are so long here. <laughs> uh, we could, uh, you know, we could maybe shave the head instead of having, actually having hair because the Buddha was a monk as well. Uh, so we could do a few things like that. But uh, I think the most important thing is just that we, express the qualities uh, coming through. That's what really matters. Uh, and some of the most famous Buddha statues in the world, there's a very famous one in the museum in Saranat. Uh, and we have a replica of that uh, in our Buddha society in Perth. Uh, and it is famous because it has this beautiful face. Yeah? It is not a face of a person, but it has those kind of beautiful, soft, peaceful, gentle qualities about it. Yeah, And uh, that to me is kind of the epitome of a, uh, of a good Buddha statue because it has all those qualities there. Yeah. So but anyway, you are you're very well. Are you an artist? Uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah? no, I'm an engineer. <laughs> you're an engineer. Okay, okay. So, uh, but as an artist, you can uh, create that. Uh, you know, new Buddha. But statue. I'll be criticized. Yeah. You will be no, no. You just do it an anonymous, anonymous artist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Man. You're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we have one more last. Oh. Final question. So, Ajahn, so, so, Ajahn, what, what's the, then what's the answer to the question, how are you? <laughs> so, what should we say then? Since you say the topic is, yeah. what should it be the Buddhist Just, answer to the question, how are you? Yeah, gr growing spiritually. Growing spiritually, yeah. How are you? <laughs> something like that no you don't have to say that all the time it's okay to say good it's okay to say whatever but sometimes we just need to know the real answer as well so <laughs> so it shouldn't be too now uh, yeah okay are we what is that it uh, victor are we come to the end or uh, yeah ah yeah and please uh, yeah okay. Thank you very much. Yep. And let's say sadhu three times to Ajahn Brahmali. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.